All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Claire Bradley. I am the Director of Irish Studies here at the Institute. Today is our January virtual meeting and we are discussing DNA and Irish research. Um, we are recording this class, so um, just remember if you're saying anything uh, that it's there for posterity. <laughs> OK, so uh, I'm going to share my screen. Oh, and one second, I just want to enable the captions. Okay. So hopefully you'll be able to see my screen now in one minute. All right. So we're talking today about using DNA for your Irish research. Um, this lecture will just be a little short overview. And if you haven't done much work on DNA yet, don't worry. The school has a whole series of 15 courses available on the subject, expertly delivered by my colleague, Shannon. Um, uh, first, I want to ask who here has taken an autosomal DNA test? Uh, you can use the little reactions if you prefer, or you can stick your hand up like Lacey is demonstrating. Um, or you can come on mic and say so if you prefer. Um, has anyone never taken a DNA test? Ellen, you've come off mic. Do you wanna say something? No, I have taken the DNA test. You have, okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Um, and has anyone taken, Lacey, have you taken a Y DNA test as well? You have, okay. Um, so this class is largely gonna focus on autosomal DNA, but I want to spend a few minutes talking about Y DNA first. Um, so, Y DNA. We, uh, we may or may not know in this group that Y DNA is only carried by men and it is passed directly from father to son. So uh, women can't take this type of DNA test, but you can, of course, get a brother or a parent or a, a paternal uncle or a paternal cousin to take this test. And all men in the same family will have the same Y haplogroup, which is how we break down the uh, results of a Y DNA test. Um, so it has the bonus that you only need to have one person in your family take this test. However, it only tracks one line of your family tree, and that is your father's, 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 father's line, as you can see here. Of course, we have many other lines, and that might not be your line that has Irish ancestry on it. So if it isn't, that's not going to be useful for you. Um, why DNA, then? Um, what do we use it for? Because it's tracking your father's 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 line, it's a good way to follow your surname. In Ireland, as in most of Western uh, Europe, most people have their father's surname. So um, for me, if I got someone to test, my brother or so on, they would be following the Bradley Y chromosome. Um, y DNA tests a number of markers, a number of positions in the Y chromosome. And historically, the first Y DNA tests available just did 12 markers. And um, they weren't they weren't very precise. I'm sure I told you this story before, but I know someone who took one of those tests back about 15 years ago and it cost him eight hundred dollars uh, American dollars. And when it came back, it told him that he was a white man from Europe, which all of which he already knew. And it don't told him nothing else at that point. But you know, we were on the road and I'm sure that that test tells him more now than it did then. Um, so um, it tell why 12 used to be the first marker that you could uh, buy a test for. And they've done away with that one now. And they have other levels, Y37, Y67, Y111, and something called Big Y, which is Y700. And that is the, the, the gold standard. But it costs a lot of money to take that DNA test. And as such, not a lot of people have done it. In fact, Y DNA tests are traditionally more expensive than... Um, autosomal tests and therefore not as many people have taken them. Um, when you get your results back, you get a list of matches at each of the levels of markers and you get your haplogroup. Now, uh, my haplogroup for my my dad's side of the family, my dad, my dad passed away before um, I could get him to do the NHS, but my uncle kindly did one for me. So it used to show that our haplogroup was RM269, which is just about the most common haplogroup in Ireland, you can imagine. 
but recently it's been refined and it now has a longer number and or or FGC 7448, which is, so they're refining these technologies all of the time. Um, it's a subsection of uh, RM269. So our difficulties with Y-DNA and using it for Irish research, as I said, first of all, you might not have Irish on your line that is your patrilineal line. So that's no use to you then. Um, but not a lot of people in Ireland have taken Y-DNA tests. I don't have statistics, but I just know from my own experience. Um, so if I look at my uncle's Y uh, test, uh, he doesn't have any matches at any level that have Bradley as a surname. Um, now, that doesn't mean that we're looking at um, what some people call unkindly a non-paternal event or some level of misattributed parentage. It probably just means that there's no one else called Bradley in the Y database because Bradley's not that common a surname in Ireland either. Um, but um, I can observe clusters of people who have got the same name. There's a few different surnames that repeat at different levels. And that might mean something, it might not. The trouble with Y-DNA is that it changes very slowly over time. So you might have a match with someone and they might be outside the genealogical time frame uh, for records to verify what you're looking for. So it might be a match and it might be 700 years ago or it might be 500 years ago. Um, but if unless it's 200 years ago or less, probably not going to make a huge amount of headway with Irish records on it. Um, However, what, what can we use Y-DNA for with Irish research? There are surname projects at Family Tree DNA, which is also the only place that you can buy a Y-DNA test at the moment. And many of them have Irish surnames. So if you've done a Y test, you can join those surname projects and maybe you can make connections with people who are slightly more closely related to you than other people are within that group. It's also good to cross-reference um, the Y matches with surname distributions. So there's two places that I'm recommending there on the screen, johngredham.com, he's a prominent genealogist in Ireland, and Barry Griffin, he's done some very interesting work with mapping the existing 1901 and 1911 censuses by surname, and then he generates heat maps of them, they're really interesting. And so you can have a look at surname distribution um, and then compare it with, with, your, with your Irish names there against the Y matches that you have. Um, but why DNA is also good if you've got a particular question. So if you're researching a branch of a family, you look, these people look like they're the same branch as me. Um, and you both, if you can find a direct Y descendant from each individual. So say you had two brothers or you thought two people were brothers, but you couldn't prove it. If you could do Y tests on both of those people, well, then if they were brothers, they would definitely have the same haplogroup. You would expect them to be matching that. If they didn't match, you could say definitively, those people weren't brothers or we're looking at a situation where someone's parentage was not as expected. That's what happened when they identified the uh, skeleton of Richard III. They looked at Y DNA straight away and it didn't match because they actually were able to track the descent of what should have been Richard's Y chromosome. They ended up identifying him uh, with matrilineal DNA, mitochondrial DNA, um, because they, again, they were able to get uh, down to the modern day with people who were descended from his sister, Elizabeth of York. Um, we're not going to talk about uh, mitochondrial DNA today. Uh, I have taken a mitochondrial DNA test. I have found it precisely useless for DNA so far. And so we're not going to waste any time on it. Okay, so let us go on to talk about autosomal DNA. So autosomal DNA, which again, you may or may not be know, know what it's about, but I'll just give you a quick rundown. It's passed on from both your parents to you. So each new person gets 50% of their DNA from their mom and 50% from their dad. Um, the trouble is when you get your list of matches, you don't know whether someone matches you on your mother's side or your father's side. Now, if you've taken a DNA test on Ancestry, they do offer something called um, a breakdown of, uh, by parent. And they label people into two categories, parent one and parent two. Now, they cannot tell you which of those parents is which, but hopefully you will be able to look at your matches and you'll say, oh, there's my cousin Lorna. So therefore, this, this parent one must be my father's side because she's my cousin on my father's side. Um, and you can relabel them then if you so wish. And the two main things that we look at in uh, an autosomal test are the ethnicity estimates 
and the matches. So let's take each one of those at a time and uh, we will uh, discuss them. So ethnicity estimates are the big selling point of DNA tests, aren't they? The how Irish are you? I'm 57% Irish and so on, um, or Scottish or whatever you like. And this is my estimate, my current estimate from Ancestry. And I say current because this estimate gets revised about once a year. And I like to keep screenshots so that I can check how it's changing over time. Um, and so it, it is broadly correct. It's telling me I have 91% Irish ancestry. Uh, it says I have 4% Wales. And the two other regions that didn't fit nicely onto the slide are 4%, uh, sorry, 3% Sweden and Denmark and 2% Scotland. Now, the Sweden and Denmark is nonsense. And I know it's nonsense because sometimes when they update these records, it says Norway instead. Um, and I also know that I have absolutely no ancestry in the known genealogical time frame who didn't come from anywhere in the British Isles. Now, of course, being Irish, I probably do have Viking ancestors, but they're a long time ago. And generally that doesn't show up uh, so well in the ethnicity estimates. Um, two percent Scottish. I do have a three times great grandfather who came from Scotland, so that's not inaccurate in that sense. And I also have a th um a two times great grandmother who came from Wales. So if we were to go back in the fifty percent from each parent, twenty five percent from each grandparent, we we'll get back to my two times great grandparents. I would have roughly three three and a half percent from that person. So for them to be estimating four percent Wales, it's not it's not bad. I mean, the only problem is that I also have an ancestor at the same level who's from England and he doesn't appear at all in this ethnicity. Um, so you can't rely on this, is what I'm saying. You can look at it at a top level and um, go, yeah, that looks broadly correct, but you don't want to get hung up on it. You know, I've often had people contact me um, uh, as a professional and say, oh, I've got this 8% Italian. And do you think that that means that I have ancestors from Italian? I am a bit sallow skinned. Um, and they're Irish, they're 100% Irish. Uh, it's just a chance. There's just a chance that that, that, that that's come up. Um, it's based on who you're matching in the reference population and so on. But to prove this, I want to show you a couple of things. They want to say, I'm going to take it at 10%. If you've got more than 10% ethnicity from a place, you probably have an ancestor from that place. Um, it, it, that's just a, a sort of a, a generalization, of course. But if we were to take someone like this, Mr. John F. Kennedy, who was the president of America in the 1960s, all eight of his great grandparents came from Ireland. They were all born in Ireland and they all emigrated and so coalesced in America to create him. If this man was alive and was able to take an autosomal DNA test, it would say that his ancestry was 100% Irish. His ethnicity was 100% Irish. And that is because all eight of his great grandparents came from Ireland. Does that mean he was Irish? No, it does not. We know he was born in America. We know his parents were born in America. Um, but th this is the problem with this, is that it, it it's referencing who's there today and comparing it. And so you can get people who are like this. I recently worked with uh, a man from America who uh, discovered that his father was not his father. And when he looked at the ethnicity result, it said that he was 50% Irish. And he, quite naturally, you might say, concluded that his dad must have been Irish. And we worked together and it turned out that his dad was not Irish. His dad was American, but six of his father's great grandparents came from Ireland. So exactly the same problem there. Um, it showed like he was Irish because his ancestral makeup was Irish. <laughs> but that doesn't necessarily mean that he himself was Irish. And that's why, of course, you don't see American DNA on these records and you don't see Australian DNA on, on these these tests because most of the people who come from those places were at some point people who came to that place. Um, so all I'm saying is you want to take it with a little pinch of salt. But if you did look at it and saw something very unexpected, like if you had already done your ancestry, you know, you'd worked on your genealogy for a number of years and you came to your DNA test and you saw 25 percent Chinese. Well, then you definitely want to be going, OK, something is amiss there. Or, you know, it, it, you know, it should broadly represent what you know to be correct about your your uh, family tree. But don't get hung up on it if it's not wrong. One of my aunts has 17 percent Scandinavia in her results. She doesn't have any ancestors from Scandinavia, you know, so don't get hung up on it. Another part that it feeds into this ethnicity, and this is something that you do want to have a look at. Um, 
in Ancestry again, um, you have these DNA communities. They used to call them genetic communities. They've changed the name of them. And this is my one. And uh, for here, what's interesting is, so it's not just saying, oh, you come from Ireland. It's breaking down my ethnicity and saying, oh, these parts of Ireland we think are relevant for you. And what I can tell you is, I do have an ancestor who came from County Clare. The Northwest Shannon Estuary is basically here, Limerick. And I have a number of ancestors who came from Limerick. Leinster is over here in the east. And it says south. Basically, it's covering the whole of Leinster. And I do have ancestors who came from Dublin and Wicklow and Wexford. And where it falls down is I have no known ancestors from Ulster. But it's suggesting that I have some connections to Ulster. Now, that said, a surname Bradley has a strong um, preponderance to be coming from Derry and Donegal. I don't have any known ancestors from there, but it, there's a good chance that my Bradley ancestors ultimately did come from there to Dublin at some point. So when you look at this, you do want to have a, have a little look and see, does it match up with anything? Or if it doesn't, you know, could you investigate people who are in those communities? When you go further down on the page, and of course, I'm not showing you live images here because I want to protect, protect the anonymity of all of my DNA matches. Um, it does show people who are in these communities and you can click on them and then have a look at their trees. So you definitely want to do that. Um, and of course, you may already have some idea where in Ireland, but I know that for many people from uh, Canada and America, big issue is where in Ireland? That's what we don't know. That's what we're trying to find out. And this is just another tool in your toolbox to try and help you figure this out. So if you're looking for people in um, your matches who come from Ireland or have Irish names, so let's get on to the matches now. So I took some screenshots from my heritage as well, because Ancestry is not the only DNA company. Um, and uh, what I've done here is obviously I have blanked out the name of the person to protect their identity. Um, so this is someone who matches me. And um, the, the matches are the real gold of DNA. You know, we're, we spent some time talking about the ethnicity, but you're, you're going to spend 10% of your time on that and 90% of your time looking at your DNA matches. So say, for example, you know that your Irish line was called Halligan and they came from County Offaly, which in the past was known as Kings County. The first thing you're going to do with your new list of matches is you're going to search for Halligan in those matches. And you don't want to just search for people whose name is Halligan now, because, of course, they might be descended from women who were called Halligan and they're not called Halligan anymore. So you want to make sure that you search in the middle box that has, you know, search in someone's tree as well and see if there's anything. And this example, as I said, is from my heritage. And my heritage tells you a few things um, of use. It gives you a broad age for the person if they have opted to put that information in. And that can be quite useful because... If someone is roughly the same age as you, you might make an assumption that they are the same generation as you, but that might not be the case. You know, remember that people could have children for, you know, 20 or 25 years and two siblings might have quite a number of years between them, meaning that their children are not at all the same age as each other, even though they're first cousins. So this match shares 87.9 centimorgans with me. And my heritage's estimate is that they were one of my parents' second cousins. Um, but you don't want to take the testing site uh, analysis for granted. I always like to use dnapainter.com. Um, and there you can use the Shared Centimorgan Project, which is independently crowdsourced information. So people wrote in and said, this is me and my second cousin, and we share this much DNA with each other. This is me and my mother. We share 3,552 centimorgans with each other and so on. And over time, they were able to build up a an average for each relationship and also a range. And the range can be very wide indeed. I have a number of people who are tested in my family who are all either a parent of my mother or my father. And the range of what I share with them goes from 215 centimorgans to 520 centimorgans. It's a big range. And the one at the bottom there, he is on the 
outlier side of it but we know for sure you know he is someone who's always known in the family he's definitely my mother's cousin but we don't share very much dna and then the person at the top funny enough is my favorite of my mother's cousins i wonder is that why because we share so much dna um so you want to you want to be having a look at the number of centimorgans checking that against dna painters shared centimorgan project page to see what other options there are other than second cousin and you will find that there are several and then you also want to consider how many segments if it's just one segment that someone shares with you or two segments it might be from a very far back ancestor um, and if it's only one segment and it gets down to below 20 centimorgans it might be a false positive it might be just that you and that person have by accident got a matching segment and that it doesn't actually come from an ancestor that you have in common so the first thing you do is you're going to look at someone's tree of course when when you see their match and in this case this person only has a tree with two people in it so that's totally useless to me unless I already recognize their name um so the next thing you're going to do is you're going to look at their shared matches and so here is the shared matches for that same individual And straight away, it's really helpful for me. Because the first thing I see is that this person matches my aunt. Now, I know that's my aunt because I asked her to take the DNA test and I control it. So that's undisputed. Secondly, I see then, and she is my mother's sister. So straight away, I'm knocking out my whole paternal side of the family tree. And this lady is my late great aunt. And she also did a DNA test for me. So again, that's not disputed. She is my maternal grandmother's sister. So I have now knocked out three quarters of my family tree. And I know that I'm focusing on my Nana's uh, side of the tree. Then this third person, this is very interesting here. I also know who this person is. And my heritage is suggesting that she's my fourth cousin, but actually, She's not my fourth cousin. She's my third cousin. I know who she is. And then I didn't know who she was, but then she and I spoke and we compared our trees and we figured it out. And she is a descendant of, stay with me now. This is the way we test later. She is a descendant of the aunt of this woman. <laughs> so she's, she's my Nana's aunt's great granddaughter. So she's my third cousin. And um, but it thinks she's my fourth cousin because we only share 36 centimorgans, which is very small. Um, but there's no doubt who, who she is. So just again, be wary, don't rely on what they're saying. You know, if I thought fourth cousin there, I might be going, well, I'll never solve that. Quite hard to establish who your fourth cousins are in uh, in Ireland because of our record lack in the 19th century. But I'm well on the way to identifying who this person is because now I've been able to focus it into um one of my great grandmother's branches uh her part of the family tree so i've really narrowed it down there with just those three people and there could well be more people that would help me refine that um the more older generations who are tested in your family the easier this becomes so i've paid for tests in my family for people who are my parents first cousins uh, as well as my parents siblings and so on um but I do have some guidelines for you if you're if you're doing that sort of thing. If you're asking someone else to take a DNA test or indeed you're taking one yourself, you should always understand what you're getting yourself into. And that means reading the long terms and conditions. Um, you want to ensure that if you ask someone else to take a DNA test, that they understand what that means, particularly if they're an older person for whom DNA is a relatively new concept. Um, so just make sure to educate yourself, you know, be aware that when you take a DNA test, you might find out something that you are not happy about. You might find out your dad's not your dad or that you have an extra sibling or something else. Um, of course, you may be taking the DNA test because you know something like that and you want to find out more about it. And very many adoptees do resort to DNA tests to try and help them resolve these unknown parentage mysteries. If you are going ahead, um, and you're putting up a tree, you definitely want to put up a tree on your uh, DNA test results and link your test to it. And that is because when your match looks at you and says, who's this person? Um, they want to know what your family tree is. So it's useless to them if you haven't bothered to do that because you can't 
get anywhere with it. Um, but also, if you are a woman or indeed a man who has changed their name from their birth name, do not put that new name on your family tree. Make sure you put your birth name down on your tree because your husband's surname is of no genetic relevance to you now. You don't have any, unless of course you married someone who has the same name as you, which, which can happen. Um, but I would say always put the birth surname of someone down um, on the, the, particularly if they're the tester so that you don't confuse anything. So that lady there, my great aunt who, who's dead now, um, she got married when she was 22 and I still have her down with her birth surname even though she hadn't used it in, in 72 years by the time she died. Um, always respond to messages that people send you. Uh, and we've all been on the other side of this. We've, you know, we, we've sent a message, no response, absolute crickets. So even if you know nothing, it's actually more helpful to reply to someone and say, sorry, I don't know anything about that because they know that you are alive and willing to communicate. And maybe later on you will know something or they will know something later that's helpful. So always reply to messages. When you put up a tree, what do you want to put in it? Now, I personally don't want to spend a lot of time putting absolutely everything that I've researched online and sourcing it correctly. So what I do with my DNA tree is I put up all my direct ancestors. I put the years that they were born and the year that they died and a place. So I might just write Dublin um, or I might just write Carlo. Um, I don't get into the nitty gritty of it because I don't want to spend a lot of time doing that. But for your matches, they it's useful for them if you if they can see that sort of headline information and they can go, oh, I'm, I'm interested in that particular area. I'm going to focus on that part of their tree. You also want to put in the siblings of your direct ancestors where you know them. Um, I always put them in if, if you know the names of them. And for any women who are siblings of your direct ancestors, if you know the names of their spouses, you should put those in too because that's where you're going to find your matches, the descendants of the siblings of your ancestors. Of course, you're going to find people who are closer to you, who are more directly related to you, but the people who, uh, the outline, outlying people are always going to be descendants of siblings of your direct ancestors. So, you know, if you can put in the names of those, the other surname, well, then that maybe is the clue to someone. Um, I, the very first person I ever connected to my tree with DNA was someone, I, I didn't know her name at all, but um, when we spoke, we discovered that her great grandmother and my great grandfather were brother and sister. And I did have her great grandmother on my tree, but I hadn't researched her yet. Uh, she was a, a sideways ancestor and I had her in the 1911 census in Ireland, which was the most recent available census. And I had done nothing about it. It turned out that she had gotten married in Liverpool. So um, I wouldn't have found her that easily if, if I had started looking for her. But her granddaughter, her great granddaughter knew that information. And then I was able to connect it and go, right. And I then did my own research. You don't want to accept other people's research straight off. We always want to do our own homework. I mean, of course, you're going to look at what they've said, but you want to verify that what they've said is correct and be aware of confirmation bias. Um, and um, then and only then might you add that person to your tree. So lastly, before we get on to some questions, I want to just go through a couple of common uh, problems that we have with DNA and how you might approach them. So the first one is that your match is unresponsive. They, they, you send them a message, they've no tree, you know, you've got nothing to go on, so you send them a message and they don't reply. Remember that not everyone has a subscription to all of these genealogy websites all of the time. And maybe um, they don't have one at the moment and they're not logging into it regularly. So try the message again. I always blame the messaging system. I always say, oh, I don't know if you got my last message. Ancestry's messaging system is very buggy, which it totally is. That's not even a lie. Um, Secondly, if your match has a little stub of a tree, like maybe they've only got their grandparents' names or something like that, you can expand that yourself. You know how to do that. You don't need to talk to them and get the information. You can just go ahead and research their ancestry for them. I mean, you don't have to share it with them if they're not helping you, but you can go on. I did that with a match, 29 Centimorgans, Morgans, but his grandmother had Bradley as her surname. And I thought, who's that now? And it took me about three hours to figure out that she was the niece of my great, great grandfather who had been orphaned as a child. And I didn't know what had happened to her. Well, it turned out that she went to Massachusetts. She got married. She lived a long life. She had many children. And I was able to connect her whole line back to my tree then with that one 29 centimorgan DNA match because the person had put that his grandmother's name was Bradley in the tree. 
He's never yet replied to my message, you understand. So I haven't been able to tell him that, but I figured it out. If the match has no tree and they never reply to your messages, we're well, going to have to rely on the shared matches. Um, so who else have you got in common and do you recognize any of those people? And this is where you can use those little cluster dots that they have on both my heritage and ancestry to um connect people. What I like to do is I like to label them with ancestral couples, usually around the two times great grandparent mark um, so that I can uh, itemize people by their group. And then when you what the beauty of that is when you get a new match, you look at the shared matches and you see, oh, I see the little yellow dot there. And that yellow dot means that they come from my lawless side of the family. Well, then this person must also come from that part of the family. Um, uh, another bit of uh, requiring stepping away from the genealogy sites is somebody's got a username or a pseudonym as their uh, uh, profile name. You could do a search on Google for that name because people are creatures of habit and they often will use the same username on more than one site. And maybe you can identify them that way. The other thing I always want to say is review your matches every couple of months, if, if, if not more regularly, because you never know when a new shared match might give a fresh clue to someone. So I have a couple of people who I don't know who they are. They've never replied to messages and I'm interested in them. I, I can't figure them out. But I saw there recently there was a new person who matched both of them and me and I contacted her and she was responsive and gave me some information and we haven't solved it yet. But this new person provided a fresh perspective um, and I was able to then talk to her about it. And that has been very helpful. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there are just some common hints for using DNA. Um, that's the end of my presentation. I'd love to hear if anyone has any questions for me. Um, and bear in mind that um, we're only really focused on the Irish DNA today, but a, a lot of what we've said, of course, is applicable to any type of DNA research. Anyone got any questions or comments? Any successes? No? Okay, I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Okay, well, if no one has any particular questions, um, we can we can end the meeting. Um, and as always, you're always welcome to send me an email if you have a query that you want to ask, but you don't want to ask in front of other people. Um, and that goes for not just today's topic, but anything that you are studying in relation to the Irish courses. Um, and uh, if that's it, we shall say good evening or good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. And uh, I'll see you next month for another lecture. And if anyone has any particular areas that they would like me to do in one of our virtual meetings as a talk, please do let me know. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Claire. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.